Well, good morning. As we praise the Lord, we also bring to him the needs of the world, uh, our needs, and we bring him our thanks for all that we have. So let us pray for the world that we live in. Lord, thank you that every day you remind us of your creation. You've given us parks, woodland close by, some of us gardens, the opportunity to savour good, fresh food. And yet it is so easy to take all this for granted. Forgive us for not always recognising the good things around us. Help us to pause our lives and reflect for a few moments, to study our gardens in depth, to learn about the magic that scientists are discovering about the way our forests work, what does all that teach us about the way we should live? And yet so often this all seems to be so tainted with the destruction of healthy environments and watercourses and the seizure of land for mining or intensive and intrusive crop cultivation, building on virgin land when brownfield sites are available nearby. We know of farmers across the world being forced off their land we all see the tragedy of wildfires, of drought and floods. We frequently and often correctly blame big business and government policy. And so we pray for the miracle of governments across the world to unite, to protect the environment and to care for the weakest and most vulnerable people. And we call for businesses across the world to behave responsibly. Lord, that's easy for us to ask. But it's also easy, we confess, to overlook our own role in this mess. Do we remember that tropical rainforests are being destroyed because we buy so much palm oil? Do we remember that mining is rampant in some places because we try to help by buying electric cars, but it's the demand for lithium and other chemicals for batteries that results in the mining that harms people and land? We criticise business for payments to shareholders, but we overlook the fact that the shareholders include many of us through pension funds and investments. We rather like those to give us a decent return. We demand government action, but then protest when that means we pay more taxes or can't use our cars freely. It's easy to ignore the fact that our major democracies depend on votes and that unpopular policies drive their voters away so what are we asking our leaders to do, Lord? What are we asking them to do? What a mess. Woe is me. Father, forgive us for always blaming others and not doing enough ourselves. We can't sort this out without you. Without you, Lord, we are lost. Send your spirit to flow through our government and business leaders, through each one of us and all your people, to show us that the path we're on right now isn't the right one to guide us along the right path to walk. Father God, come into our lives, bring your kingdom across this and every land. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. From Psalm 27, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, our families, our friends and our community, raising before you especially people known to us to, uh, known to, us to be unwell in mind, in body or in spirit those who are grieving, those anxious about their future. We've just heard about Joan in hospital and we, uh, Lord, we, we raise her before you. Uh, we call for healing, we call for good, good care um, from the medical people and also from her friends and neighbours, Lord. And just in a few moments, we raise to you people that are known to us who are in need of, of a special care and special love at this time. We also pray for the public services that support us all, particularly people who are vulnerable, that they overcome staff shortages, that the people who do work for them are relieved from stress, overwork and tiredness, 
We pray for enough money to repair broken buildings and equipment. As the long school holidays got underway, we pray for the children whose parents have to work and have no money or no nearby family to provide childcare or for healthy meals while the schools are closed. Keep our children safe from the temptations of gangs and drug dealers. We pray for security for all families. In our own nation, as the supply of affordable housing dries up and families are forced into temporary accommodation, sometimes leaving behind schools and friends and having to move miles away. And we pray even more for families in war-torn lands where nobody knows what the next day will bring or whether they will ever have peaceful and secure homes again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in seeking a better place, we thank you that the world you have created is still awesome, that through science and the inquisitive minds that you have given us, we learn ever more about how your creation works, how we can avoid harming it and help to support it. Thank you that you have brought us to this day, that you've brought us together right now, whether physically or through technology, that you are with us in every step we take. Remind us, Lord, that when you appear distant, it is us that have drifted away, not you. Guide us in our thoughts and actions. Let's be encouraged by the word in Romans 8.31, here as expressed in the Message Bible. So, what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? I pray now our diocesan prayer, living God's love, which is prayed in churches right across the diverse family that St Albans Diocese is. Living God, draw us deeper into your love. Jesus, our Lord, send us to care and to serve. Holy Spirit, make us heralds of good news. Stir us, strengthen us, teach us, and inspire us to live your love with generosity and joy, imagination and courage, for the sake of your world and in the name of Jesus. Amen. And finally, shall we say together the words of prayer that Jesus himself has taught us? On your screens now. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning everyone. Um, today's reading is Romans 8 and we are starting at verse 26. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tracy. Well read. Uh, what a conundrum it is. It's <laughs> exactly this wonderful verse, um, verses in Re- Romans that is the reading today, actually, for the Anglican Church. And I have to say, I looked at it, and I love Romans. But when you think that I wrote 10,000 words on a dissertation on three verses, and now I've got all these verses, I have to say, um, I've had to kind of like look at it and go, hmm, how am I going to make this? Um, in sort of 20, 25 minutes, something that makes sense to the rest of the planet. So I'm just hoping it does, okay? Um, Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us today that we go from this place encouraged, knowing we are saved, knowing we are loved by God. And Lord, may we be more like Jesus Christ every day, we pray. Amen. More than anything, um, the scriptures... I think, you know, Paul, it's all about us becoming like Christ. It's all about us becoming like Jesus Christ. And that is what um, Romans is really about is, you know, it's about us working out our salvation, if you like, being part of the whole process. Um, And these are what these scriptures are about. And uh, I'm going to touch on different bits here. And uh, as I said last week, go away, pray for yourself, look for yourself, decide for yourself on scripture. I am not here to dictate. I would like you to start investigating these passages and see what God says to you. The end part of Romans 8 is a call of victory. It's a call of victory. It's a reminder that we, as the children of God, have an amazing future way beyond this life. And it's really important, I think, that we put these scriptures in the context of eternity. Um, that this isn't just about what's happening now today. This is, this is about what God, the future of God's people is about, okay? There's a lot of that, isn't there, in Romans. They know the, the, the world is groaning, we did, didn't we, a few weeks ago, waiting, waiting in expectation for the future glory. Now, in this first part that was read from the scripture, from 26, we are reminded that God is planning to make us more like Jesus, which, which is what I just started with. We are to become more like Jesus Christ, and that's really important. That is not to lose who you are. So it's not talking about your own individuality, as in God has made you with a personality. He's made you um, to look like you look like. God wants you to be who you are, who he's called you to be, with the gifts you've called him to be. So we're not talking about that, okay? Because it doesn't mean we're all robots that all kind of go around like this, you know, exactly the same, wearing the same clothes and all the rest of it. But we have our own personalities and who God has made to to be. But we are to be the people who are fully alive, fully healed and fully reconciled with our creator forever and ever and ever. And that's what we're heading towards. That's what this is about. It's about working that out, okay, in your life now, today, you and I. We can't ignore that all through the scripture, God chooses people. You go and look through the Bible. God is always choosing people for certain roles, for certain tasks. And if you look at most of those characters, they really don't deserve it. King David, is. you look at his life, he's like one of the worst. The stuff he gets up to, I mean, murders, he does all sorts. And yet, by grace, God has called him. This is a reminder that we all are called by grace. We are all loved in grace. It's actually not to do with us. It's to do with Jesus Christ. It's to do with the cross. It's to do with the fact that we're all saved saved through him when we come to know him. And it's to do with him, not us. So, but there are certain things and roles that people are certainly called to. You know, I felt called to ordination, you know, um, and... To be honest, I looked at it, and most people that are called to ordination will look at it. And, and uh, I know ministry, Simon's called to ministry, will say the same in this ministry. You think, really? Me? You know, you've got to be kidding. But we have this sort of roles that we're called to. There's something about how God uses the gifts we've, he's given us for the glory of God, for the kingdom. That part of our journey in this world is also to walk with Jesus into the call and purpose he has for our lives, in other words. 
you have a call and purpose in your life that God wants you to walk in, okay? And that can be anything, and it's all important, it all matters. It could be making tea, it could be going and uh, walking dogs and just talking to people. It could just be praying for people. It, can be, it could be that you're called to a ministry to stand up and preach or do something, and please do talk to me about that as well. It could be all sorts of stuff that God is calling you to. All of it matters, all of it is important, and none of it is more important than anything else, okay? Um, God knows everything. He knows the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He knows as we choose. He knows all that. God is in the past, the present, and the future. And this is where you're getting your head around this. It's almost impossible. And I will say, I was always taught never to push the mystery button too soon. So we're not going to do that. But there will be some point when you have to go, don't really get it. Because the truth is, there are so many scriptures that you could mix up around this and go, go with this or go with that or go the other. But understand that God has love and God wants you into the kingdom. So God is in the past, the present, and the future. And our lives are part of his eternal plan. And that's the most important thing is we are part of his eternal plan, you and I. We are part of that. That's why we were created. Now the second part from verse 31 is a reminder of how powerful our God is. That nothing can stop God's plan for us and for this world, for, for all that we see. I don't know about you, but some of the photos, I've said this, I, know, I think I said this last week, some of the photos of the planet and the heat and that, it's quite frightening, isn't it? It's really frightening what, you know, and it doesn't mean we don't have responsibility because we're called to be stewards for our planet. But the point is, nothing can stop God's plan. So as God's people, we also need to hold that in our hearts as well, that whatever happens, God is in charge. Whatever happens... You know, we are called to be Christ in this world at this time, in a time when it can be quite frightening about what's going on around us. And thank you, Bob, for praying so much about actually us being aware of what is going on in creation, what is going on and how we treat our planet and who we are, because those prayers, I thought, really hit on something where we have responsibility to be stewards in our world today. But we are reminded here how much we need God's power how much we need the Holy Spirit in us as well, through us and around us. The Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to help us to pray. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, it transforms your prayer life. When you ask the Holy Spirit to help you when you're reading Scripture, it can transform how you read Scripture or listen to Scripture. I have audio books playing a lot of the time. It's great, you know. So, And interestingly, I put it on today, and it was on Romans, and I thought, that's cool. So I think God's there, so it's great. Now, earlier in chapter 8, before this bit of scripture is read, Paul makes sure that we know that the Spirit lives in us. Those that are called, those that know Jesus, the Spirit lives in you and me. Okay, it lives in us. The Spirit that resurrected Jesus is going to resurrect you. And if you remember last week, I said this, but we are now to be led by the Spirit. But led is not by the hand in a kind of like, oh, I'll just go this way and that way. It's about being consumed by the Holy Spirit. Allowing the Holy Spirit in your life, praying every morning, Holy Spirit, come, be with me, live in me, help me to be different, help me to be more like Christ. It's allowing the power of God's Spirit to, to use the gives in us that when we're praying for healing, when we're listening to God, when we're hearing his voice, we can prophesy and we can know that God is speaking today. It's living that really exciting, Spirit-filled life. Being led is consumed by the Spirit. Let's be consumed by the Spirit as a church today. We do not battle alone. We do not battle alone. Jesus is in it with us. The Holy Spirit is in it with us. The Father is in it with us. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. You know, when people speak in tongues, it's what it is. It's the Holy Spirit and their spirit speaking. It's a, it's a wonderful gift to have. doesn't matter if you haven't, but, you know, it's a wonderful gift to have because it helps your prayer life. So that you know the Father and you can be full of, fully um, full of joy. We should be the most joyful people in the world because we know the hope and love of God in our lives. That we can be heirs in the kingdom, knowing anything can be possible. Anything can be possible for us as God's people today. 
And in verse 27, we're reminded that the Spirit is interceding for us. That is, the Holy Spirit, sometimes referred to actually as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, is interceding for us. That is, the Spirit is communicating with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for us, and praying for the will of God in our lives. So this is where it gets very kind of, you know, okay. But that's what's happening. So, you know, we are being prayed for constantly. In verse 28, we then have a well-known scripture that all things work together for good. Now, this scripture is often slightly misinterpreted. It actually, when it says things, it actually means that it is God who's working working things for good in our lives, not things, okay? So God is working for the good in your lives. That's what it's actually referring to. That's what it means. The truth is, we all know that bad things happen to the best people. Is it not true? It does. So you can take that and you can go, yes, it makes me feel all nice and fluffy. But the truth is, we look around and we think, hang on. <laughs> best people, we see awful things happening to them. This is an eternal goodness. This is something beyond that. This is God's goodness. This is different. God wants to do amazing things for his children. There's no doubt about that. Um, and this is about us having that relationship with Jesus Christ, and that is the good things in our lives. That means becoming more Christ-like. That means even the bad stuff will work out in your life, because this relationship is beyond our life here on earth, and ultimately, God will bring justice to the world. He will redeem the world. He will put things right. And everything in our lives, both the good and the bad, is news to make us more like Jesus Christ. So it's slightly different to just saying all things are going to work out. Ultimately, all things will work out in Jesus Christ as we become more like Christ. Okay? So it's God who does that. The scripture then comments that we have been predestined to be like Jesus, first of all, okay? That like him, we are to be resurrected. We, that know him and love him. And the message of scripture is all about Jesus. You know what, whole of scripture, the whole, look at the whole time, it's all about Jesus, you know? It really is, when we say that, but it is. It's about us becoming like Jesus. Jesus is God, his sacrifice is to redeem the world, to bring hope that salvation is through him and only through our faith in him. Christ Jesus is the key to the redemption, not only of you and me, but the whole world. And not only that, but it says we are being called. That is, we are to respond to the voice of God, to be part of the family of God and glorified. And this glorified is actually in the past tense, okay? In other words, God already knows it's going to happen. We're already glorified in the, in the, in the past. It's already happened. We are glorified because we are part of this wonderful family of God, okay? Now, predestined is sometimes interpreted as to say there's lots of different ways of looking at this, and I could be here all day unpicking this particular bit, so I hope I'm not going to confuse you more, but I might do. Okay, I apologize now. But in, is, um, in, it's interpreted sometimes as to say God knew who, God, who was going to say yes to Jesus. It's a rather simplistic view of it because I think it's a bit limiting view of it as well. There are very different views on it. One is that it suggests that God hasn't given us a choice. Doesn't sound right to me personally, but some of you it might do, you know, that actually you look in Scripture, you can pull out different parts. Double predestination, you might have heard about double predestination. Now I'm really doing your heads in, aren't I? But that suggests that some are chosen and not to believe as well, which I struggle with that, if I'm honest. Um, but you cannot ignore these scriptures, and there is certain things that are indicated through all the, through the scriptures that suggest that God is choosing you and you choose God. And I think that's kind of where I am. I believe that he, you know, he knows the beginning, middle, and the end, and, and actually he chooses us and we choose him, but it still has an act of choice. Most of that um, teaching is very much in the letters, of course, and the letters of Paul and that as well. But in John 6, Jesus says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. Okay. But note, he then says, whoever comes will not be driven away. 
give an indication of choice and acceptance as well. We also have to choose and accept the gift that's given us, you know. So we're given it, we're chosen, we're given it, but we also have to act on it. He says, everyone who looks to him and believes will have eternal life. Everyone who looks on him and believes will have eternal life. It would be an un unacceptable narrative at the time, of course, as well, to talk in this way, as the Jews were considered the chosen people. So they understood this language as well, maybe in a different way to what we do. They understood it, but they still didn't choose the Messiah, a lot of them. So they were chosen, but they had to choose. But of course, many didn't choose that, the ultimate gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. But there is a choice. Some did. Many did as well. But there is a bigger picture. And there is also a narrower belief that it is not to do with our freedom of choice, because that's important, otherwise we're robots, but it's to do with Jesus dying and rising to bring about salvation. That's why God knew what time it was. God knew that Jesus was going to come. God knew that Jesus would die for, the, for everything, for the world, for us, for everything. And that all of this has always been in his plan. I get some security in that, because if God's plan has always been all of this, then he kind of knows what the plan at the end is as well. And if you read in Revelations, because we know that, there'll be a new heaven, a new earth. So for all that is going on in our lives, in our world, in our community, in our church, actually, God's plan is something greater than we can ever even imagine. And we are part of it. That's pretty amazing. Because it also says that God's will is that none shall perish. So I expect there's an awful lot more chosen that a greater number than we will ever know or ever understand. So some of this is in the grace and mercy and the love of God. And I suspect this mystery is one where God, knowing the future, also means that God will know what we choose, but we still choose. We still have to respond to that invitation with faith. And that's, we are called to be obedient. It makes me worry a little bit less about the church, as in the church, not because actually I need to go out and share and be Christ to other people, so do you. We all do as the church today. But actually, it is Jesus' church. It is God's church, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit church. And you know what? There will be some who say yes and some say no. But actually, there will be the church, and it will exist beyond me, beyond you. We cannot convert someone. We can only lead them to that faith. And the Holy Spirit does the converting. So we are, our call is to be like Christ in the world, to proclaim the message of good news. So we mustn't get too caught up in the mystery of it, but just know that basically God is in control, God is eternal, and we can be absolutely 100% sure of our destination, Jesus Christ, through the cross, when we accept the gift of grace that has been given to us. And we can't lose that because it's the gift of grace. We, none of us deserve it, but God does it anyway. God loves us so much, he just wants to be with us. Isn't that amazing? He just wants to be with you. He just wants to be, he just wants us for eternity to be part of the plan. The words used in the act of salvation here, of course, um, there's this lovely sort of line, isn't there? A predestined, foreknown, elected, called, conformed, justified, and glorified. There's almost like a a working out of salvation here. And you've got this lovely plan of working out of salvation. And all of those, by the way, are written in the past tense, which means that it's already done. It's a foregone conclusion. God's plan is such, and it will happen. God knows it all. Glorified, being included, because it is certain that we are glorified when we come to know Jesus, when we're part of his plan, when we're part of that. And we will become like him. And what does it mean to you to be like Jesus, I wonder? That to me, when I look at Jesus Christ, is to be someone of justice, someone who is a good steward of the planet, somebody who is obedient and goes out and talks about the good news to those that are lost, somebody who's full of the power of the Holy Spirit, praying for healing, hearing from God, 
Spending time in the presence of God. Someone who is full of mercy. Someone who is loving. Someone who is compassionate and has empathy and truth. Somebody who is not out to trip anyone else up, but to welcome everyone into the kingdom. To be people who care for the poor, the sick. People who show respect to other people. People of prayer and scripture. Patient and self-sacrificial. I don't know about you, but I can't do that on my own. I can only become like Christ as I allow Christ and the Holy Spirit to consume me, to become my life. Our salvation is something that is continued after our conversion. We work it out. We walk in the gift of our salvation every single day, accepting it, knowing it, and loving the God who loves us to be more, what, more like him. Can't do it on my own. I can't do it at all, actually. Only he can do it. And that's the point. Only God can do these things. But to be heirs of God, we have to first be children. Then, it, then if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, taking into consideration all I've just said, how can anyone be against us? God is all-powerful, almighty, He's got the end sorted out. He's got the middle sorted out. He's got the beginning sorted out. He's got eternity sorted out. And it means laying down our own agenda. Your own agenda in your life, my own agenda, to sacrifice, to serve, to be part of the kingdom of God. And picking up God's agenda for our life and for the church today, to be the church. And you and I are the church today, together. God being for us is about our salvation and our relationship with him, not our agenda. We are to be led by the Spirit, consumed by the Spirit, to get on board with Jesus and the kingdom work on earth today to make a difference, to show others who Jesus is through who we are together collectively. You know, we must remember that a lot of the Old Testament is always written in we, not I. Always in t- Even the I in the Psalms apparently means we. Always, you know, and when we sing our worship songs, we should be singing as we, we together are examples of Jesus Christ, the church. We were never meant to do it alone. We are to be led by the Spirit, working for the kingdom. God is for us because Jesus came and gave everything for us. And nothing can separate us, the church, you and me, God's people, from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can't earn it. Give that up now. Stop striving. You can't earn it. You can only receive it, accept it, and change the way you think about yourself. You are a child of the living God. You are loved. You are embraced. Grace. We are chosen by grace to know that Jesus Christ forever has us in his plan. We don't ever deserve the gift. It's just receive it and allow your gifts then to bless the world. Allow the things God has put in you to bless the world. And God has a purpose for the church today. It isn't over. It will never be over. Not for Jesus. His church matters. Our mission, though, as God's people, is to go and share good news with the world and be good news to the world. There will be those who say yes when we share it, and there will be those that say no, but we are called to share it. And it is the Spirit that will witness to that person that will convert them. But we get to play We get to be part of the process. We aren't separate from it. We are the plan. We and you and me, we are the plan. Isn't that just so exciting? We get to play in the kingdom of God. And this stuff is eternal. All the other stuff we do, brilliant stuff, though it might be, it's not eternal. What you do, it's not eternal. This is eternal. This matters. Where... People spend eternity matters. Where we will be forever matters. And we are part of that process. We are to obey and we are to preach to all the nations, to everyone. Because God's will is that none shall perish. 
And there will be places where we see growth because we are just getting on board with what God is doing. And it's doing and will, what he is doing, sorry, and what he will do. We're just getting on board with it. What is God doing? So I want to say, where is the spirit moving today? What is God doing? I see that in gyms, you know, I see all the people come in there and stuff the conversations, and I think the spirit is moving. And what should we be plowing into? What is really important? What really matters? What should we, the church today, really be plowing into? How can we reach more into this hurting community that we live in? Because that is how we become more like Jesus Christ. That is what Jesus Christ did. And the very final then part of Roman 8 are summed up by saying, we can be absolutely sure of Jesus Christ. Be sure of him today. God is for you. What does that mean to you, that God is for you? What does it mean in your life? And how does that mean you live differently? How does it mean we as a church act differently when we know that God is for us? And in verse 37, we are not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. It goes way beyond the plan, in other words, that we see on this earth to something more we, we can't even imagine what waits for us. We can't even imagine what God has for us. It is so amazing. Why? Because Jesus saved us. And nothing, nothing, nothing can take that away from us. Nothing can replace the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from God. And a life of love is a life given to Jesus and then shared with everyone around us. So I'm going to let us pray in a minute. I'm going to sort of band. Would the band like to come on? Come. I wonder if we would just ask you to stand for a moment then. And uh, if you can, if you can't, please remain seated. I don't mind. God doesn't care less either. Um, just stand. Maybe just, I don't know, some of you want to just, we just want to first of all pray that we will be filled with the Spirit today. So if you want to put your hands out in front of you, do. If you don't, don't matter. It's, um, I'm not here to control, but, you know, if you want to, that's fine. And let's just pray that we each will be filled with spirit to walk, to be the people that Jesus has called us to be. Accept your salvation. Becoming like Jesus today. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, now, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Just fill each one of us here with your presence. And, Lord, I pray now that any uncertainty of salvation is removed now in the name of Jesus Christ. Any uncertainty of salvation will leave you. Any uncertainty that you are part of called, part of the plan, removed. Accept the gift of grace that's been given to you today. Say yes. Say yes to Jesus. Come Holy Spirit and release in us as well the gifts of the Spirit that we will see healings. We will hear your voice. We will see impossible things happening. Help us to pray that we are good news to our community. Help us to love those that God puts in our path. Who is God putting in your path to love? And Lord, forgive us when we made it about other things. Help us to be called to be the church. To be the church. To be like Jesus. And then others will join us. So Holy Spirit, come and as we worship, receive more of the power of God in your life now.